All right. Hope you all got some uh, renewed nourishment there. Uh, whether that's... Yeah. So, um, let's go into, um, into your second outline. And once again, the disclaimer. Uh, I may or may not talk about everything on that outline. I hope to. Um, and then the outline is just the skeleton, so there will be more things to add. Um, I call this little session Maximizing Opportunities. Uh, really has a lot to do with uh, time management, has a lot to do with uh, a little bit of project management, calendar management, tasks. This is going to be a very uh, practical session. Uh, but also from a biblical perspective. So if you're going to serve, you're going to serve others. I talked about having to uh, create enough time. I talked about making yourself available. Uh, this is a very practical way to do that, uh, to give ourselves some more availability and to be more efficient. I want to see who in here is as efficient as you need to be. All right. I got plenty of room to grow and I teach the stuff. I taught it a lot and I still have room to grow and get better. So let's talk about maximizing opportunities as opposed to miss opportunities. Let me see a show of hands. How many of you have ever missed an event that you really wanted to go to? Yeah. How many of you have ever paid a late fee because you missed a due date? Yeah. Uh, how many of you have had to work late because you hadn't finished your tasks for the day? Yeah. Those are missed opportunities, all right? On the other hand, how many of you have ever really paid close attention somewhere you wanted to go and you, you bought good seats, you went in advance, you, you camped out and you got there and, and enjoyed a great time? How many did that? Yeah. Yeah. How many have ever prepared your taxes early and wasn't fretting April 15th? All right. Three people. All right. Or May 17th, as it is this year. How many, um, how many of you, how many of you regularly, you finish your daily tasks and then you look into tomorrow's or the next day and get the jump start on those? Oh, yeah, I got a few people doing that. Okay, great. That's maximizing opportunities. And the difference between the two in many cases is timing. Did we do the right thing in the right way at the right time? It's a matter of timing. Now, Scripture teaches maximizing opportunities. Paul wrote this in Ephesians 5, make the most of every opportunity in these evil days. Make the most of every opportunity. To me, that's maximizing opportunities. How do we do that? Well, let's think about a few things first. Uh, first question and thing to think about, is time important to God? Does time matter to God? Does he pay attention to time? The Bible says, Moses wrote down, the Lord appointed a set time, saying, tomorrow the Lord will do this thing in the land. God set appointments. Jesus Christ came by appointment. Did you know that? Amen. Galatians says, when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son. There was a set time and appointment. It just wasn't, you know what? Uh, I think today I'll go down and... and take on the form of a man and just live with my folks. No, it was according to a process and a plan. There were things in development and it came to a certain time. During his life on earth, Jesus remained aware of time. In Matthew, he said, go into the city to a certain man and say to him, the teacher says, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. He was aware of points in time things that were important to him. So he had an assignment and a time, and he allowed time for that job. So time is important to God. So then the next question, is time important to me? Is time important to me? Um, 
a friend of mine was teaching a seminar, and I think it's a beautiful illustration, so I'm going to steal it from him and give it to you. Uh, there are two different kinds of ways to, that people look at time and two different kind of people. There's one group of people, when you get the assignment, listen, I need you to be there at 9 o'clock. There's one group of people that that's one time. There's another group of people where there's 59 opportunities for that time. One group of people, 9 o'clock means 9 zero, zero. Another group of people, it means 9, 901, 915. As long as you're still in the 9s, 959. There are 59 options for another group of people. All right? There you go. Now we got it. Okay, it showed up. I didn't tell the story well. So is time important to me? It's been said you can tell a person's beliefs by how, they, how she spends her time and her money. How she spends her time and her money. If our neighbors followed us around all week and then they went through last month's bank statement, what would they conclude about our beliefs? How am I using my time? That's a question that we really should repeatedly ask ourselves. What gets the most of our limited time? In my opinion, time is more valuable than money because you can't make time back. You can't recoup time. Some fictional story writers fictionalize about what if you could buy other people's time. Well, that's a neat concept, makes for a great fiction story, but it's not real. I can't sell you my time, you can't sell me your time. We, time goes past and it's gone. The time is incredibly valuable. So we need to think about our lives. Are we missing opportunities? We maximize opportunities. Think about your life. When you end the day, think about this past week. Look past the week. Most of your days, do you feel like fulfilled and satisfied? You got done what you needed to? Or were many of those days frustrated and disappointed? And based on your thought, if, if you're frustrated and disappointed, then we can do better in what we to maximize opportunities. Do we believe time's important? We also need to ask this question, what steals our time? The Apostle Paul in Acts 17 talked about the Athenians. They spent their time in nothing else but to either tell or hear some new thing. The Athenians spent their days on Facebook. That's what the Athenians did, to tell and see some new thing. They were just chatting about people and times, and Paul is critical of that frivolous use of time. How about us? How much time do we spend talking about new things? How much time do we spend social media? How much time do we spend following the news? I can go down a news rabbit hole. I don't know about you guys, but I could just read the news, read the news, read the news, and like, whoa, whoa, what time is it? You know, it just gets away from me. Um, we need to be honest with ourselves and know what's our biggest time-stealing weakness. Rather than thinking about everything that gets us, what's the biggest issue we have with time? And once we think about that, how can we stop that thief from stealing our time? One great way is a simple way, but it's a tough way. Simple and tough. Simple in concept, tough to practice. Accountability. Accountability. If you're married, have your spouse help you. You got a good teammate on your coworker, have your coworker help you. you. Got a fellow saint mentor, have them help you. But confess the issue that you trust to someone you trust and invite them to, hey, ask me about that. How are you using your time? What have you done with your time? How are you working with this weakness? What are you doing about it? Here's the other thing we can do to help us with time. Our decision-making process for time. All right? We work a job. That's not discretionary time. They tell you when to be there and when to go home. Unless you're an entrepreneur, you own your own company, then the clients tell you when to arrive and when to go home. All right? But the time that we're not working is our discretionary time. What do we do with that? We decide how our recreation is. We decide how our sleep is. What do we do with that? How do you decide what to do and when to do it? Right. 
Let me ask you this. Do you tend to do what's easiest? Do you tend to do what you like to do best? Do we let other people decide what we're going to do with our time? Solomon said this, to everything there's a season and a time for every purpose under heaven. Paul said, make the best use of the time. So a wise disciple, we're not looking for time excuses. Instead, we're trying to do what is best with our time. All right, take some work, take some time. And it takes a session like this now and then to say, yeah, you know what, I need to do better with my time. Uh, I am not perfect with my time. I'd like to do better with time. I'd like to keep things valued. It's good for me to review what I'm talking to you right now just to help myself. Do we plan for success with our time? Do we plan to be successful? Daniel said at the appointed time, and that was recorded then in Psalms, for the time to favor her, yes, the set time has come. So there's set appointments. So let me talk just a little bit about some time management practicalities. Three things. I think I left these uh, just as three numbered elements in your outline. These are three things that I think are very powerful about time. Three simple truths. Number one, when it comes to appointments or assignments or tasks. Here's number one. I won't remember. We got to confess that to ourselves. I won't remember. It's better to assume you'll forget than to assume you'll remember. I won't remember. Number two, here's the truth. So I record things in the same place. I'll, I'll define these here in a minute. And the third thing, I check that place at least once each day. So here's, what do you say about recording things in the same place? What do you mean? You ever get in somebody's car and they got post-it notes all over the place? And you go in their house and they got post-it notes all over the place? And you see their Bible and they got post-it notes all over the place? I mean, those are nice, but how, how do you check them all at any point in time? Uh, I know people who write some things down in a paper, you know, like notebook or journal. They write some things down in their phone. They write other things down on their computer. Well, that's nice, but you don't have those three things with you all the time unless they're connected electronically. So I won't remember, so I'm going to write it down in the same place, and I check that place at least once daily. Now, these things come together in two categories, a calendar and a task list. Now, I'm going to suggest you just find a device that works for you and you stick with it. Maybe that is a paper calendar. All right, great. Then you keep that calendar with you everywhere you go. You, if, if you're going to be a paper calendar person, when you go to bed at night, put that calendar on a nightstand. Because you'll think of something as you're falling asleep or when you wake up, and you should write it in that calendar. Take that calendar in your pocket or in your purse and carry it around the house everywhere you go. If you're going to be a paper calendar person, it should be everywhere you go. And anytime you think of something that's an assignment, that's a date, that's a calendar, that's a task, you need to write that thing down. Amen. And then every day you check it. Every day you look there. Now, if you're more on the tech side of things, man, there are some wonderful technologies and apps to do this. Um, I live, I'm a Mac product person. So I've got software that syncs on my iPad, on my cell phone, and on my computer. And anything I put in one goes to the other. And then I categorize those things a calendar. If I've got to be somewhere, let's talk about a calendar first of all. No, let me just stop with that. Choose a thing and stay with it. I won't remember. I'm going to write it down in the same place. I'm going to check that place every day. Whatever device it is. Now, if it's not working for you, you've got to be honest. Is it because I don't like the paper calendar? Or is it because I'm not being faithful to it? Is it because the app and the computer's a problem? Or is it because I'm not being faithful to it? If you're not being faithful to it, then just work harder. Uh, but if a device isn't working, it doesn't work for you, the app's not working, the program's not working, then ditch the thing and get you something else. Now, um, 
Let me say this about a calendar. You got to keep, you know, I love it here. I see in every room I've been in, there's a calendar. I don't know who's responsible for that, but that's just wicked cool right there. Calendar everywhere you go. Um, you cannot overdo announcing events. Got to be a calendar on the wall, got to be a website, got to be emails, got to be notifications, got to be social media, and people will say, I didn't know what was happening. Okay, that's just the nature of what goes on. So you, you got to have a calendar. Got to write it down, got to keep it current, and got to update it always as soon as you know. When you're adding to the calendar, let me give you this piece of information. You know, we got to go up to pastor here and I say, he invited me to come down here. And he said a couple of dates and we looked at him. Now when he gave me dates and I looked at my calendar, I did not just look for the date he wanted and is that open. I also looked at the days before and at the days after. Because I need to think, can I be ready for this? What's happening before then? Will I have enough time to prepare and to be ready and, and have my mind right and all that stuff? And then I have to think, what's happening afterwards? I think we talked about it doing something later, and I couldn't. I got afterwards. I'm going to Phoenix next week, so I, I got a deal there. And I got to be able to fit that in. So sometimes we look at a calendar and somebody says, hey, 4 o'clock Friday, can you be there? And you look at your calendar, there's nothing at 4 o'clock Friday. And you say, yeah, I'll be there at 4 o'clock Friday. But you didn't look at earlier Friday. You didn't look at later Friday. You didn't look at Saturday. Y'all with me? Yes. Now look at the spectrum of things on the calendar. And do you have enough time to get it all done? So when you're adding to a calendar, do it thoughtfully. I can't emphasize enough looking at the calendar and planning your week. Weekly, maybe daily. How much do I need to do that? It depends on your responsibilities. I see some folks in the room who are likely students or have been students. You don't stay on top of assignments unless you pay attention to due dates, period. Period. And if you don't pay attention to due dates, let me tell you what your life is. All nighters. That's what your life is. Because all of a sudden, the teacher sends out a notice, remember, tonight by midnight, this is due. And you're like, ah, because you didn't work a calendar. So you got to look beyond. When you're looking at a calendar, don't just look at today. Look at the week ahead. Look at the month ahead. Look three months ahead. Spend time. And when you're doing that, it's very likely that ideas and thoughts will come to mind about events. As I looked ahead at the calendar, I saw this event on my calendar. And my mind began to process some things I wanted to, you know what, I need to check in with Pastor, kind of bounce some ideas off of him. And I wrote it down. As I was looking at the calendar, and then I went back, and I, I reached out to him and said, what are you thinking? So in order to process that kind of stuff. Now, tasks. So a calendar thing is appointments, you're blocking out your time, but then there's things you got to do. When you're looking at a calendar, then you got to put in the time-based tasks. Organize your tasks according to when they're due the soonest. So I've got things listed for tomorrow uh, that are due tomorrow. I got things listed then later that are due on dates. I put dates, I used to put times on it, it kind of depends. Uh, we run our congregation on quarterly small groups. For a whole year of quarterly small groups, for me to run that, uh, there are about 100 tasks that are dated in my task list. And those things just keep coming. <laughs> and they're dated by time. So I don't work on the one six months from now because it's easiest or because I like it and it's the most fun I got to work on the one that's due. I got to get on that one. I got to get on the one that I should have done last week. <laughs> I got to chase that. Everybody with me? Organizing your tasks by dates. Um, any, anybody use electronic task organizers? Yeah, got one. Again, if you're a Mac person, they have something called ta or reminders. Oh, my Lord, it's a powerful little piece of software. Reminders. You can schedule them to remind you repeatedly. 
Um, I used to be a Microsoft person, and Microsoft Outlook has like all kind of great stuff with tasks. You can drag tasks into the calendar and drag calendar into the tasks. It's some powerful software. Made a couple of guys pretty rich. Um, so that's a pretty excellent thing you can use, but something to keep things organized so they don't go away. When I first got involved in this, where my memory couldn't keep up with my responsibilities, that was in the days, how many remember the paper things called a day timer? Anybody remember a day timer? Yes. Day timer, the way they worked is you would write all the things you needed to do today, and it's paper on pencil. And anything you didn't get done, they said, you have to move it to another day. Well, I would do things just because I got tired of scratching them off or erasing them and writing them down again. After you've written the same thing down about four times, you're like, I better do this because I'm just sick and tired of writing it down. Now, electronically, you know, I just did, did change the date. <laughs> it's not as big of a pain. Um, but think about your tasks. Here's another thing when you, I want to talk about tasks and days. You've got to know yourself. When's your best personal productivity? How many in here are your night owls? You like to stay up late, night owls. How many of you are morning people? You just wake up chirping with the birds, yeah. How many of you are good from like 11 a.m. to 1? <laughs> yeah. So just know yourself. When are you most productive? If you've got an assignment, a task that requires some real concentration, then what's the time of day that you concentrate best? And schedule that time for those kind of tasks. Use that time, know when you're better. How many of you, you know when you like to talk better? I mean, for me, I'm not very talkative in the morning. I'm really not very talkative any time. But on occasion, I like to make some phone calls and have some conversations. I want to know the time of day when I'm good at that, and that's when I'm going to schedule it. You know, are you with me? That way I can be most sharp for those things. Um, otherwise, you lose some maximum output. If I know my best time of concentration is between 8 a.m. and 11 a.m., and instead of filling that with concentrated work, I just respond to some fluffy emails and send some text messages, I'm wasting productivity. I could do better by knowing myself and putting those things in certain categories. Uh, I know a man, one of my mentors in the course of my life, he was my pastor when I was a youth pastor. The guy's seriously productive, has held a lot of positions, led a tremendous church. He's retired now as a bishop, but he's a prolific writer. I mean a prolific writer. Not a, in addition to creating messages and sermons, he just writes like crazy. And so I said, I don't understand, man. I don't, I don't get it. How? How? How do you do that? I know all your responsibilities. How are you doing that writing? He said, I write between 2 and 5 a.m. Excuse me? <laughs> Excuse me? How do you do that? He said, it's quiet. No distractions. No phone calls, no disturbances. Everybody in the house is asleep. It's quiet. I can concentrate and I can write. Now, that's what I'm getting at. Not that you have to work between 2 and 5 a.m., but to know yourself, fit the task to the time. Does that make sense? Yes. Here's the other thing about time is we need to be honest with how long it really takes us to get something done. Yes. And we mark it in our calendar. Well, so-and-so wants me to do this. That'll take an hour. And it takes an hour and a half. Then your schedule's trashed. You're already in trouble. Well, I, I can get that done in an afternoon, and it takes a day and a half. You're in trouble. Anytime you go to do home auto repair, forget it, right? My son-in-law said, I need to do brakes on my car. We're going to do all the rotors and all the pads. I said, okay, come over on Sunday early, because we have church on Saturday. Okay? Yeah, it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Four-wheel disc brakes. I said, come over early because I know there'll be, we'll have to get all the parts that you want, everything you need, but we're going to have to go to the parts store. Yeah. And, so, and that's exactly what happens, right? You're going to do home repair, you know, and they, eek, you tweak a bolt off, you're like, ma. And sure enough, two different times, we're calling, we're doing, we're moving around. We didn't ever even get done that day. 
because there was one bolt that we tweaked you couldn't even find. He had to get it flown in from somewhere. Three days later, it cost $2, but we couldn't find it anywhere, you know? Yes, yeah, you're right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, I had to finalize putting the, uh, what's that mounting caliper, the, the mounting thing that's going to hold the disc brake unit. At any rate, um, so anyhow, we had to get that done. What are you saying? I'm saying, you know, some things we can do better to schedule with. If repeatedly you tell yourself, I can mow the lawn in 45 minutes, but it's repeatedly taken you an hour 15. We're killing ourselves by just scheduling 45 minutes to do it. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Learn ourselves, figure out what it is. Let's be honest, let's be candid. What's the difference? If you schedule 45 minutes to do the lawn, it takes you an hour 15. When you're done, you're frustrated, you're rushing, you're like, this is crazy, now I'm behind. Or instead, you schedule an hour and a half, you get done 15 minutes early, it's like, yeah. You did the same job, but what you do to schedule it reasonably and engage what it is you're doing. So give yourself some margin. The difference sometimes between minimize and maximize opportunity is being really honest about how long it takes you to do something. Uh, then I brought it up with the automobile repair thing, unexpected times. So here's the thing that happens. You got this nice, neat calendar, and you got this cool task list. And here's what's going to happen. One of the kids is going to start puking all over the place. And something's going to happen. There are unexpected things that take place. My wife come home the other day. Hey, some, I, the tire's low on air. I think we got a nail or a screw. I hear it down to the end. Nick, tick, 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 tick. You know, something's in the tire. So the next day I'm at the tire store. Was that on my calendar? No. There are unexpected times. Go down the list. Sicknesses accidents, storms, today, traffic. You know what I'm saying? There are things you can't predict that are unexpected times. So they're out of our control. What do we do? We create margin for those things. Create margin for those things. That way there's not amazing frustration and you're not late and they're not undone. Best thing, again, rather than to get to the end of the day and you're not finished and you're frustrated, to get to the end of the day and be done sooner and then be able to start on tomorrow's list or the next day's list. Getting the same amount of work done, it's just how you deal with it and how you feel about it. Um, let me say this about margin and time. Sometimes we're not in response to our time. Ever, anybody ever had a... <laughs> I took a job one time, new to the job, it was a job that needed some attention. I had a reputation of being fairly good in that particular role. And so I'd been in the job a couple of months, and my boss uh, just kept wanting me to do some other things. I, I'd been, this job needed some attention. And I'd been there just a couple of months, aligning, coordinating, systematizing, training people, and he, he comes to me after a couple months and says, hey, do you got that all straightened out? I said, no. He said, you haven't given me any chance to work on that because you're giving me all these other problems. That was probably the mean way to say things, but I can be cantankerous sometimes. Uh, better thing to say, when a boss is coming to you, you've got a job, you know what you're doing. Sometimes our employer doesn't understand how much time it takes to do a job. They don't understand... Uh, the intricacies of it. They just think it ought to be quick, quick, snap, snap. They maybe have never done the job. Uh, they maybe don't understand the difficulties of it. As we were just talking a minute ago about changing brakes, there were people in the room nodding their heads, yeah, I know what that's like. Maybe other people in the room like, I got no idea what they're talking about right now. All right? Bosses can be that way. And so if your boss comes to you and you're buried with a day's work and you're buried with tomorrow's work and they say, listen, I need to have this by the end of the day. Here's the way to handle that. Listen, I'm happy to do that. I'm working on this other project and these other things. Which one of the ones do you want me to not do? I just, just be candid. Just be direct. You're not being rude. You're not saying I'm not working. But you're saying, listen, you need to understand this is what I'm working at. 
if I do this, that's not going to get done. Will that be okay with you? So dealing with the things that are unexpected, sometimes the unexpected comes by your boss. We can pray for efficiency. If you look in Scripture, there's a couple of times where God stopped time. He stopped the sun in the sky. God just stopped time. For one guy, he moved the, the sundial backwards. How cool is that? God, God can manipulate time. Now, I don't believe we should be bums with our scheduling and then say, God, bail me out of this. I don't, I don't think we should do that. However, I do think there are times when we've done our level best and we're under the gun on something and we can say, Lord, help me to be more efficient. I think we can say, Lord, help me to be sharp and clear in my thinking. I, I think we can say, Lord, help me to really... Uh, if it's a creative thing you're working on, give me some ideas. I think there's ways we can pray and ask the Lord to help us to really get a clear mind, to get focus, et cetera, to make the most of the opportunity. I remember um, young married, my daughters were, they weren't even both in school yet. And this was one of the adventures when I went back to school again. So I went back and I was going to take some classes and I made a commitment I will not lose out anything in serving people, anything in ministry, anything in my job. And I had a few things going on, and I wouldn't miss any family time. That The only thing I would do is miss sleep if I went back to school. And so that was my commitment to my family. That was my commitment to God and to the work of God. I'm just going to miss sleep. And there were some times when I, got, I was down on it, and I just said, Lord, I need to be efficient. I need you to help me. There's a small window of time. Would you, would you help me? And I would tell you repeatedly, the Lord helped me. I, I'd have to write a paper, and man, it just flowed. I, um, and I believe it was God helping me. I don't, I don't believe it was... I've been studying. I've been working. I've been reading. I gave God something to work with. You know, I didn't say, Lord, help me write this paper. I haven't done any of the reading or any of the research. Just make me, give me an A paper, will you, God? No, I wasn't doing that. But I want to say, you know, help me bring it all together. You all with me? Your mind ever gets scattered? You're just all, all over the place. And like, Lord, I need to shut all that business out and need to rein it in and be effective. And the Lord's helped and I don't think he treat me any better than he treats you. I just offer that's a great way to pray and to take advantage of. Um, here's the thing with all of this. In order for anything to change, we got to be willing, able, and ready. Now, I got that from Dr. Cindy Miller. She's a counselor. I heard her speaking, and she said, people do not change until they are willing, able, and ready. If you underline the first letters, it spells war. <laughs> People don't change until they're willing, able, and ready. And you know what? All of us having fun, smiling, thinking about these things. Nothing changes tomorrow unless we are willing, able, and ready. Nothing's going to change. Until we want to be change what's comfortable now into what's better tomorrow. Now... There's a great book called Leadership Pain by Dr. Samuel Chan. It's an amazing book. He says this, that growth, development, requires change. And change usually means loss. It means loss because we only have a, a limited amount of resources in our lives. So to take on something new, that means something's got to be left behind. So growth is equal to change, change is equal to loss, and typically losing something is painful. We don't like to lose things. So you got change is equal to, growth is change, change is loss, and loss is pain. That means growth equals pain. <laughs> All that long way to get to that short statement. Growth equals pain. If you and I are going to grow, are we willing to endure the pain? He makes a statement that people will not change until the pain of change is less than the pain of staying the same. Typically, if the pain of change is greater than the pain of staying the same, we're going to stay the same. Interesting, right? 
So we only grow to the threshold of our pain. And I, I'm just asking you, if you're frustrated with your maximizing opportunities and you'd like to get better, is that painful enough to say, I'm going to go through the pain of change? I'm going to do it better. I'm going to grow. I'm to develop. If your answer is yes, you want to grow, you want to change, then I'm going to ask you to do right now something. Look over that outline and put a star by two things that you want to work on. That whole outline. So maybe what steals your time, your decision process for using time, are you planning for success, do you budget sufficient time, do you allow margin for the unexpected, do you pray and ask the Lord for help, just put a star besides two of them. Star two of them and start there which is really a very friendly way to really address all manner of seminars and lectures like this. You might walk away feeling like you're drinking from a fire hose, but just choose a couple of things. You know what? This and this are two things I'm going to work on over the next two weeks, the next two months, and try to improve and better. And there you go. You've listened to me ramble on for a long time tonight. Thank you for your attentiveness. Some people are sleepy, but nobody's been snoring, so thank you very much for that.